Hi, and welcome to our session on responsible innovation. Move fast and fix things. My name is Chioma Ume, and I work at IDEO as a design researcher. Uh, as part of that, I'm working on our inclusive design practice at IDEO and spent a lot of time thinking about how we can evolve our design process and practices in the direction of a more inclusive future. Today, we're gonna to be talking about responsible innovation and not just regular innovation with a little bit of responsibility, but what we wanna talk about is what happens when we use responsibility from the jump. You don't have to look very far to see the far ranging consequences of not thinking about responsibility and innovation. There's lots of impacts from ethical, cultural, environmental, and beyond. So the question that we have today is how are we gonna build the fundamentals that we have and evolve them into a place where we're looking at responsibility going forward? It's clear that we can't solve the problems of tomorrow with the things or the processes that we've used today. So we need to talk about what the new thinking is. I'm really lucky to be on the virtual stage or the Zoom room or the Microsoft team room <laughs> with some leaders in the area of one of the main event horizons of data and design uh, who can give us some sorry, who can give us some perspective on helping us think about what's at play and what's still needed. So to get started, when I think of responsible innovation personally, what I'm thinking about is innovation that considers environmental considerations, cultural considerations, and not just as afterthoughts, but really at the beginning of how we start our work. Starting points that sit as importantly as the commercial consequences of the work that we set out to do. So I think it's really important that when we start this conversation, we establish that frame. And that's what I'd love to start with is your perspective on how you would describe what is responsible innovation? What are we really talking about? Ed, would you like to kick us off? Sure, uh, thank you. And, and I, I'm excited to be here today. We've got a great group of people. Uh, maybe we'll each introduce ourselves as we go, just to give a sense of where we're coming from. Um, yeah. My name is Ed Doran. I'm from Microsoft Research, and I lead uh, product management for new incubations. So we're a team that is thinking pretty carefully about what are the big issues that we need to wrestle with in terms of which projects do we do? What are the impacts of the projects in the world? Um, and then what are the selected projects we can do to try to test, test things out, to prove that we can do things in a sustainable way, in a responsible way? Um, and so I think this is gonna be a great conversation for us because it's a chance to, for each of us to share our experience and to think about what responsible innovation looks for us. Um, but should we say hello to our other panelists as well? I'm Wally Brill. I'm the head of conversation design advocacy and education at Google. And in that role, um, I deal with trying to expand the world of conversation design. Conversation is a great democratizer when we think about how we interface with technology. Most people can talk. Most people can can have a conversation. So what we need to do is expand the world of design so that lots and lots of people can design for these technologies and open it up so that more and more people, millions of people, billions of people can use them because they're very, they're, it, 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 when I say democratize, basically what we're doing is we're putting really simple tools in the hands of everybody to get things done. And so I'll, I'll, I'll go. Um, I'm, I'm Karen Gieber. Um, I'm a former architect, a apologetic consultant. Uh, currently, I, I, am, um, I run a design team and an analytics team and a research team that are all coming together to work at the intersection of, of this exact question um, with a company called Amazon. It's a fairly new role for me, so I actually can't speak deeply about Amazon, but I can speak deeply about the challenges that we're looking at. And when we think about responsible innovation, we have a background in architecture. I think about like the transition of time horizon artifacts. And so when you create physical things, the artifacts and, and sort of the responsibility associated with that, it's a different timeline than when we create digital things and sort of the thought that's given to those, it's very easy to create digital things. And so we forget about how long those, those things will be out in the world but also what impact they will have in perpetuity 
And that's just a different level of training. That's a different context. So this is sort of a transition. I don't actually know what responsible innovation is. And it's something that's changing every single day. And just like our universe, it is expanding. And there's more and more places for all of us to be in that space. And this is a really exciting time because we don't know. And everybody has a seat at the table. Um, I think about it as like a global group project um, and anybody who went to school and was in a group project knows that sometimes those are harrowing and that there's always strong opinions but that the really excellent work shows up when everybody participates and I think for me that's sort of the the really interesting piece of, of what we're what we're facing right now and I don't know what the time horizon is but I know that it is expanding we should be looking at it. Mm -hmm. I love that idea of everybody is involved and we're not sure where we're going and I'm really curious if anyone wanted to build on that in terms of what the potential is. Like, we're in this conversation. What's the potential of a world where we think of innovation responsibly? Well, well this is a, a thing that's kind of dear to my heart because I think there's a, a shift happening. I think there's a, a major shift happening where we think about, you know, as designers, it's almost a little bit elitist you know we think about gathering requirements and you know user requirements and then turning those into products and this that and the other thing and i i think that was okay because we we all thought that we were getting our information from people from the users and um amplifying it in in the way that we made things that we hoped were useful right I think it's going to turn on its head and I think what's going to happen is that we're going to find that we industry technology become really a resource to people and that mm -hmm. we're making things that people almost individuals but certainly communities design and they, they design it by just being who they are and how they do things and it's it's much more a pull than a push from us and I, you know, I, I really believe this. I, I think, you know, we have issues like climate change, which we're not going to design our way out of. We just, we, we don't have the chops to do it. It's going to take millions and billions of individuals who have great ideas, who have social responsibility, and who, who want things to happen. And they're going to pull from us and make us do the things that need to be done from our perspective. So I love that point because if you think about it as a shift to the people that you're trying to serve, by definition, you start thinking in a much more holistic way, right? You move past technological feasibility, you move past business viability and say, yes, and are we thinking about fairness, transparency, inclusiveness, sustainability, privacy? Um, what's interesting though there is that I actually think that's where you build the most durable value because it's deeply entwined with the communities that you serve. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think there's often sort of a false dichotomy between are you, you know, are you innovating in a rapid way, are you innovating in an interesting way, and are you innovating in a responsible way? I actually think responsible innovation will probably drive more value because it's more part of people's lives and is more likely to be durable over time. A little bit to Karen's comments earlier. Yeah, I mean, I think Here's the thing that I struggle with as a designer who's looking for use cases and a mathematician who, who looks to build like the actual things that we learn from in the corpus of knowledge. Um, and there's this idea of like we're using design to serve a user and it turns out that we might be categorically wrong in that space and it might be the other way around. It might be that users are defining the systems that they need and that the, the hacks that come off of this and that's the big question mark, right? Is this like I think it used to be very easy to think about discrete um, sort of products, features, and now we're in a world of truly integrated systems and platforms, and we never ever considered what would happen if these things got because we couldn't conceive of it. And now that it's happening, sometimes human in the loop, sometimes not, like our, our legal constructs, our political constructs, our economic constructs, our social constructs are simply not set up for this. And so when we think about how we derive value, I love what Ed's comment was because like the definition of value will fundamentally change. We cannot think about, you know, 
any form of responsible social um, community, any kind of definition around innovation that doesn't also address <laughs> the change of what value means. Um, and, you know, look, we all work for companies, and so value often means growth and monetary value. But that might, in fact, that is something that needs to be examined. And we don't have the tools for that or the governance, and that's what this conversation is about. And what does it mean in terms of competition? You know, mm. corporate competition. How does that get leveled? so that we're not actually driving in different directions or trying to get a piece of the pie, but in fact, we're trying to save the pie, you know, as a group. That's a really interesting, this, this, the, the thread of community that's coming out of both of your comments is really interesting to me. Uh, I'm a product guy, so I have to go back to like, you know, things that live in the world is try to test myself. Um, and I like Karen's comments about how things change. And if there's nothing else we've learned in the last 12 months is that things can change very quickly and on huge scales. Um, so let me let me give you a product example that I think speaks a little bit to that, you know, community community catalyzed change. So we were doing a project in uh, Canada's most northern territories, uh, Nunavut. It was, a, it was a very defined project. It was simply let's connect government services and then COVID hit. Well, then the value of the community was not just let's have conducted government services, it was can we now teach kids in school? And when we expanded to that, then the then the, the, key, the value was, wait, the elders of the community are struggling to communicate with some of the younger people because there's a language gap. So we actually did a grant to pull uh, Unutuvik, um, or the local language, Nukutuvik, I'm sorry, I'm mispronouncing that, into Microsoft Translator. So now the elders and the younger people can not only interact with each other, but they turned it around and said, now we're going to learn this language. Mm -hmm. So it's where a community defines where the value is being built. Mm -hmm. And then you have to evolve the product, evolve the design and evolve the process as you go. Um, to me, that's the kind of thing we're gonna be doing more of as we go forward, because value is defined by the people you're serving. And I think the change, if anything, is gonna be coming faster than ever. Mm -hmm. I think what to, to add to that um, is sort of we've seen this in our in our past as well. And I think that as product people and design people and people who work for technical organizations, there's this propensity to create a plug and play like you turn it on and you can use it. And actually, we've found we think about like the if we think if we look at the history the historic arc of innovation, that's almost never where it starts. So if we look at something as basic as like the television, to be able to run a television in the past, you had to be a little bit of a citizen engineer. You had to understand like when to pull out the vacuum tubes, you had to calibrate your television to the, the, the actual waves in your particular district. Like we take for granted the fact that you can turn a television on, although nobody's doing that anymore, and um, flicking to a particular channel. like. That used to require some significant engineering, even after you bought the television. And so as we think about like, how do we normalize these new behaviors and what are the components that we're looking at? This may not be plug and play. And so we need to start thinking about like the rails or the infrastructure or the container in which we're gonna put that. And that might change the definition. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I mean, that's a spicy thing as a product or a design person where like it may fundamentally change the definition of your career. You talk about move fast and break things, you know, it's like we really, really have to allow things to evolve very quickly and they have to be able to evolve. And in, in an AI sense, you know, one of the things I love about speech recognition is that it improves all the time just because people are talking to it. You know, it, it, it does its own development. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering how that works with other systems. Are there, are there, you know, what other things do that? Nature does. I have a question actually that's a little bit built on that with that idea of move fast and break things. Because as the monkey of our conversation, move fast and fix things, there seems to be a tension as we talk about all of this possibility and all of the people who would be involved with the idea of moving quickly. And, and I wonder if in your comments you can address like that tension. I'll, I'll chime in really quickly because I'm actually fairly new to the, the technical world. I'm not new to the, the sort of the idea of creating a corpus of knowledge and using that from an engineering standpoint. But one of the things that I think is very interesting about like move quickly and break things is that it actually also disenfranchises people when we do break things because 
when you choose to say deprecate a particular product somebody uses or has an affinity to because you need to break things by deprecating that product or literally taking it offline you're disenfranchising a group of people and so that is slowing us down and so this idea that to move quickly and break things to continue to be more and more inclusive and to be socially responsible and aware might be that in the short term we have to take something offline and we're just not equipped as organizations to do that categorically because there's so many other things. So then what happens is as we're moving fast, we're bringing more and more stuff with us and that comes a challenge. But again, part of this wider conversation about like where could we go if those rules that we accepted, sort of the orthodoxies that we believe are true, aren't necessarily true. Like what orthodoxy should we be challenging with that? Right? Mm. Wow, that, that's a great that's a great point. I, I actually was thinking about the move quickly and fix things uh, in, a, in a different vein, which is, well, maybe some, for some things we're not moving quickly enough. Um, you know, we could talk about this in terms of climate change and we can think about some examples there. But, you know, we had a recent example where we designed something called the Xbox Adaptive Controller. Um, and we didn't move quickly until we had a large set of partners who could teach us how that controller needed to be used. Now, even to the point that we had to redesign the box the controller came in so the people that we were targeting who had muscular skeletal challenges could open the box, use the controller, and then have an array of devices that they can use to play games. We could never have moved that quickly if we hadn't engaged the community, if the community hadn't built an ecosystem to build products to plug into it. Um, so I think I think you're absolutely right. There's, there are real challenges with running global scale services for billions of people and pulling things on and offline has its own challenges. On the other end, though, sometimes I think we could be moving faster. And sometimes I think we could move faster if we involved more people and involve people who currently aren't at the table to teach us things that we just haven't thought deeply enough or carefully enough in the past. Yeah, you know, it's very interesting you say that. There's there's two things that come to mind for me. One is we had a project called Project Understood, which was mm -hmm. about helping, well, helping, it was about getting folks with Down syndrome to teach our systems how to understand them. And so it allowed us to have a whole new community that could use products and not just benefit from them, but teach us about them. And then extrapolate that to a place like India, where new really cheap phones with intelligent assistance on them can allow the farmer to communicate with the internet very easily without having to be literate you know it's 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 an amazing opportunity and it that brings billions of people in in connection with the internet and and in connection with with everybody else so it really does draw in new new you know new and massive communities um I love this because I think that's the only way we're going to survive. I think, you know, that universal sense of everybody contributing, everybody participating, um, the level or the democratization, again, um, is how we're going to make it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, go ahead. No, please. I'd love to hear it. Yeah. So, with, so with this is my question, though, is I I agree. I say the more the merrier. But again, going back to that global group project, the more people working on the group project potentially slows it down. And what's the governance? Who like there there mm. could be equal, equally right and equally wrong and everything in between. And so what what is the governance that we're putting in a in a, you know in a university setting? It's like the professor and the grade how we're defining what good looks like and the governance surrounding inclusion is a huge question mark. And I think it's something that we're very early days and we're going to get it wrong. We know we're going to get it wrong every like, And so the question is, how do we get it wrong the right way? Mm -hmm. Well, continued and forward momentum. And those are things that we're working on, like, and this is stuff where we can take pages out of, again, architecture or, or city planning or university coursework where we look at like public comment periods, but again, what's the governance and what's the implication that comes with that so that we can continue to move at the pace of change that we need. Otherwise, you know, but the, the past year is a great example of what happens if there isn't clear governance and we're not sure what good looks like and we, don't, we aren't moving at the 
Karen, I think we lost you at the last sentence that you said. Maybe you can repeat that. I'm not sure we'll pick it up around. Uh, I, I think I said something to the effect of like, perhaps it's not moving at the point that we should be, but we need to start thinking about the governance so that we can make space more because the hospital will not require to, to, to sort of live, to, live up to the full promise of this sort of um, project. Is it governance or is it guidance? Exactly. I don't know. Mm. Genuinely, no. Could it be as simple as some tenants? Like, we shall do no harm. And, like, I don't know. And these are things that we're testing every day. We're testing, you know, specifically in my role, we're testing this in the, it's sort of like, what does it look like for associates? What's it look like for shoppers? What's it like? It, it's every part of it. And so it isn't necessarily like us as tenants, right? Things that we will want to do and we can add or subtract as we find things are working or not working um and that's that's a real i don't know how we roll that out globally but it's a worthy challenge and something that i'm really interested to, to, to take yeah, different in lots of different um communities countries yeah, um and we can take the best from everywhere um but we have to be prepared to get it wrong sometimes and then move forward I, I'm glad you brought that up. I think you're making an excellent point. Um, I, I kind of, my response to that is it's a yes and. I think there are principles to how we work that are going to have to evolve. Those principles get turned into practices, which are like guidelines, et cetera, that turn into tools, and then you have governance as well. Um, best example I can give you is, you know, we went through that process for facial recognition. The governance wasn't there for its application uh, for policing, and so we said, we're not going to do it. Yeah. Um, we simply said, as a company, we're not comfortable with this being used for policing, so we won't allow our system to be used for that. Um, we followed all the principles, all the practices, but we need that last piece. So I appreciate Karen bringing this up because there are probably times when we have to look at the whole picture and ask, have we completed this chain before even a product hits the market at all? Yeah. Um, and that's a that's a that's the right question to ask, and I'm, I'm glad that's you know there isn't an easy answer for some of that. I think building on that is is like outside of our digital environments and thinking about our users, like we're coming up against the actual limits of physics right now, right? When we think about more compute, more storage, faster access to the internet, we're, we're literally coming up against like actual electrons, like power plants not being able to make the amount of power that we need, being able to cool buildings and understanding the wider, like sort of not just social, but environmental implications infrastructure in cities that simply isn't aren't capable of handling the, the sort of increase in, in traffic and velocity and, and what all of that means. And so we're about to face some really tough questions in that realm as well. So something that we think about like the speed of the internet or access for everybody or you know more compute when we start looking at quantum computing and whatever else is do we want to spend our, our our limited electrons, which we can't make more of necessarily on the planet for that? Or like, where is the diminishing return? And so, again, this isn't just big tech. This isn't just there. This this is, again, a systemic implication. Um, and we have to look at that in every decision that we make to understand the long term Im impact. Well, we've talked a lot about you know, expanding who's using things, where we're headed, uh, even up against the limits of technology. But I'm curious on a practical note, like what does it look like to open the aperture of this conversation? How do you have people beyond the ones in the room with you, beyond even who you define as the user? Because typically we think of that relationship, product and user, but this conversation is much bigger than that. So how do you incorporate more of these perspectives and think about how you think of stakeholders differently? Mm -hmm. Ultimate crowdsourcing. <laughs> basically, yeah, basically everybody everybody has to help design. I, I think that's a great point. I think we want that outsourcing. We want that more inclusive stance in terms of who's at the table, who's contributing. But I think we also, when we do that, we have to be willing to hear about the hard constraints that, that Karen's talking about, which is, yeah. you know, you bring people to the table, you have to be able to listen to what's not working what's not sustainable, what's not feasible, what's not, you know, and they try to rethink it. Um, so I think it's a combination of the two is that, you know, have being much more inclusive, but also being more honest where things just aren't working properly. 
Um, I love Karen's example of, of you know, the limits of physics. Uh, we went through that recently where, you know, data centers run the overwhelming majority of people's digital experiences, right? They do wonderful things for networks and they deliver things to devices and they do great computational loads. But in a tongue in cheek way, they're kind of the world's most expensive space heater. Uh, they generate a ton of heat and it's expensive and hard and you have to fix that. Otherwise, if it's expensive and hard to do, then very few people on the planet are going to be able to do it. And that's an issue of equity and inclusion. Uh, so we did an experiment and we said, OK, if these things get hot instead of bringing water into the data center to cool it, why don't we just pick up a data center and throw it in the ocean? So we put it in a container and we dumped it under the ocean for two years and pulled it out. And it was equal to or better than, in some respects, existing data centers. And we're going to take what we learned there and put it back into the land-based ones. But we never would have had those conversations, to Karen's point, if we weren't honest about the limits of what we were doing. And if we weren't honest, to Wally's point, about what people were telling us about what they really needed. Um, I think you want that wide aperture to get the feedback, but then you have to be open to just plain doing things differently. Well, and I also think that we have to be, you know, participation is the thing that changes the world. But it's, you know, this is a terrible analogy, but, you know, being the new member at the at the Thanksgiving dinner table to a family that have all known each other for a really long time feels really awkward. And so while you've been included, there's something about needing to be like an ally and amplify the space actually make space for that not just listen and understand but but actually like make a welcome part of the community and that's also hard we don't know how to do that yet um and and how do we how do we balance all of that um and just having the awareness that that's a problem is is actually is a real thing and it's a first step um and it's something we should think about and all of these in that that vein it makes me think about relationship building and I'm curious what the role is of relationship building, both among the companies that you work for, but also among the people that you welcome to that table. Because I think that's part of what you're getting at, is that there has to be something more than you just sitting there for this to be effective. Can I, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the statistic wrong, but it blew my mind a number of years ago. I was at a conference and it was um, somebody had just won an award for um, basically uh, motivating a whole bunch of uh, NGOs around saving the ocean. And then I heard this crazy statistic that there are more than 10,000 NGOs specifically organized to save the ocean. And so that to me, it, it struck me as, as so interesting because there's a, certain, there's a certain preciousness to your individual cause instead of recognizing the wider cause. And that actually has some incredibly damaging downstream impact because of the so I think we need to make space for nuance but I also think that we need to collectively align around the bigger cause and so I think it's a it's it's from both sides that we need to think about not that there are sides but if tech companies are creating a, a platform or an environment we also need to bring in sort of the wider goals from a downstream standpoint which is like wider inclusivity um, equity parity all of the all of the ease that we're looking at but recognize that you can't, with all of the individual nuance, get there without first getting the vector right. And so by vector, I mean the directionality, um, right? And so where can we each give a little in the middle so that we can, that we can actually influence change? I got a question for you. How does money enter into this? How does, how does exchange you know, of, of, of funds enter into this? Does it does money change to make these things possible or is just money change as an effect of these these things we're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you asked a nuanced question. Dollar question. Yeah, I mean, I think like I'll just I'll throw it out there. Yes, absolutely. We have to start thinking about that differently, right? I mean, and we just saw that um, when we when we saw a recent platform uh, go through some some hostile investing um, at, the, at at some hedging versus non-hedging, and that broke an entire system and understanding where value comes in and, and who controls money and what does a collective look like. And I think we need to be prepared for changing financial models, changing stakeholder interests, and understanding what we actually mean to get when we when we think about value. Um, mm. And value exchanges are going to like 
we absolutely, again, it's an orthodoxy that we might need to re-examine and it'll make a lot of people uncomfortable. Yeah. Mm. I love that. Uh, I don't I don't think I'm smart enough to play the stock market, so I'm going to stay away from that. Um, but I do think I think yeah, having a more holistic view of what value is makes sense. Um, and if you do the right job, you are generating value for multiple stakeholders, some of which will be financial. Right. Um, and I think there's good examples of that. But I think it's thinking on longer time frames to Karen's initial comments and thinking more inclusively on who's gener who's garnering the value that you create to some of Wally's comments earlier is really the key. Um, and to that, to that respect, responsible innovation is fundamentally a team sport. Um, you are unlikely to have a durable product unless you have more people at the table. You are unlikely to have a truly competitive product unless you're bringing the people whose lived lives are reflected in it, into the process of designing it and building it, or to the comments earlier, shaping it. Um, so I think we're going to see much more focus on community to capture some of that value and maybe to carry on some of Karen's earlier comments to share the value that comes out of it. And just to, to add on to that, and that this is where timeline comes in because mm -hmm. we've now, uh, and I'm not going to make bold sweeping statements, but the simple short returns, those are all taken care of. There's probably many more, but the big challenges that we're focusing on are long term and they have long time horizons and so value will be defined differently it's not quarterly it's not mm -hmm. actually it's in decades and so understand like that's going to change an investment model but it also needs to exchange the value return model that we're that we're looking at and i don't know that that the way we currently value uh, products or exchange or even organizational value is equipped to handle that right now um, and that's another conversation that needs to be had. There are mechanisms for it. I just don't know that people are comfortable exercising those mechanisms right now. Well, mm -hmm. what's uncomfortable about that? What are some of these mechanisms that make it, that might be good, but are pushed up against? I, I mean, like the, the mechanisms ultimately of like publicly traded companies, right? Which are reported on quarterly earnings and therefore returning value to shareholders, which is 100% what they're set up to do. But if we look at the longer term value, we're also in the business of keeping people in business and delivering value to customers, users, communities, cities, governments. And so that time horizon is one that needs to change. Um, and this has been widely debated on like the business roundtable. And, and so I, that is out of my depth of, I, I, I'm not an economist, I'm not an econometric specialist. I don't know what the implications are of that, but I'm absolutely interested in having a conversation with somebody who does so that I understand what role I play in that. I just think we're still in the 20th century. We haven't gotten to the 21st yet. I think politically, I think I think um, I think COVID's held us back. I think all kinds of things keep us in a slightly older mindset, and we haven't really had a chance to open up, you know, and and think. In, in in kind of fresh terms, but I think it'll come. So I have, can I, I'll, I'll add to that. Um, because I think what, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what I think you basically said was, we need to have a truth and reconciliation moment. And that's something that needs to happen in both individually on a one-to-one, -one, that needs to be on a one-to-many and a many-to-many -many model. And, and we absolutely need to um, start having a conversation about that. In parallel, as with all systems, we need to think about not just the truth and reconciliation, but the tools that we're creating. So I think I, I couldn't agree with you more. We're still in the 20th century. And what what motivates me as somebody who worked at the intersection of data and design is that in the 20th century, we had mechanical fail safes for systems that were working, right? If you didn't want something to turn on, you unplugged it. If you if, if you weren't sure, sure if something was safe or not, somebody put a red sticker on it, right? And so those mechanical fail safes were something that we had a hundred years to get rid of, get used to. They were very visible, and we don't have those mechanical fail safes. We don't have mechanical systems anymore. So now we need to think about digital fail safes and what do those look like. And that's what motivates me because we don't have a language for that yet, and we need to work towards it. And that's not just us designing it but also users telling us what they think and we like we we do this now if we all like we all know what a hamburger menu looks like and we know what a button looks like 
And that's great, but there are intelligent systems that are working in the background that we need to be more transparent about. So as we think about a truth and reconciliation moment, we also need to think about how do we communicate the mechanical fail safes and the rights associated with these systems. Um, and we don't have that yet, and we need to be working on it. Um, and lots of people are. Yeah, there's, I think, uh, I, th I think there's, there's lots of goodness here. I mean, I'm the eternal optimist. I think as we move forward from that, that's our opportunity to think about how can we use what we've already built, right? I mean, there's so much of what we built to use your, to extend your analogy of mechanical systems in the past. We learned a lot of how to build things from a mechanical engineering perspective. We learned how to extend those into making new things and to make them more efficient. We've built some incredible digital assets, some computational assets that we can extend uh, to Wally's point earlier of extending language models to an underserved population. You know, we have a lot that we can do together once we've gone through that reconciliation moment and that we can we can leverage together. And I think in many ways that's the more sustainable path because rather than reinventing the wheel, we pick up the tools we've built and we apply them to new scenarios. We bring in to serve more underserved populations and we do new things. Um, so I'm very optimistic about as we move forward what we can do. And we do it ethically. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But we have to do it together, right? Um, that's the one thing is there isn't a path forward where everyone goes their own because it's just too hard. It's too complicated. It's too expensive. And the problems um, are too big. Yeah. 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 But that's where things get really interesting, right? I mean, we've we set up an entire AI for good program that does AI for, for the earth, AI for cultural preservation, AI for good, AI for accessibility. And we're having pretty good results for that. Um, we did a project recently for the Snow Leopard Trust, where you know if you want to protect endangered animals, you have to know how many they are and where they are. Well, going through thousands of photos to find them is very expensive and time consuming. So we helped them with first pro bono work and then a grant to use AI models to identify the leopards. Um, that's not an easy question computationally, actually, because you don't know if you have 30 pictures, if it's 30 leopards or 10 leopards and one leopard that's all about the gram and is just, you know, posing it up every day. So, but that taught us how to build not just image identification, but image classification. So mm -hmm. we can help with endangered species. We can have the challenges to Wally's point earlier that teach us to do things better and more interesting ways. And then we turn around and put a lot of that into open source so other endangered projects can use it. That's the kind of thing I think we're talking about, which is we can leverage what we've built, we can take on new challenges, we can be honest about the limitations of those new challenges to Karen's point earlier, and then we can try to take that value and put it back into the community. Mm -hmm. um, it's a small thing, it isn't everything, we don't have all the answers, but I like to find the ways where we're starting to move forward down that path. Mm -hmm. And I think this conversation has shown some of those steps, but also some of these big grappling questions about where sure. we're headed next. And towards the end of our conversation, as we're heading there, something that I keep thinking about is how do we know? Like, like in the practice of doing these interventions, how do we know that, know that we are moving towards more responsible innovation? So maybe that can be from some practical examples that you have from your work, or even just a framework that you have in your mind about how you know you're making incremental progress. Um, well, I'll I'll just say a framework that that I commonly use and 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 my teams commonly use is is that we're solving a problem and it, it's so different in so many different contexts. So we we default default to a framework which is have we it's called the steep framework or sometimes called the steeple framework, which is when we look at a solution or a potential um, problem that we've defined. Have we looked at it and understand the implications socially, technologically, environmentally, economically, politically, and or legally, depending on what construct you're in? And so we may actually end up with big gaps. And what we almost always find is, is that we've looked at something technologically and that we've looked at something economically and maybe politically. And then we, we find these small gaps when it comes to uh, we should really, okay, let's go put another filter on it for social or let's put a filter on it for um, economic and without fail. Every time we do that, we end up with a better answer. Um, and so while we're never there at the beginning, we can continue to evolve when we, when we, when we not force, but when we hold ourselves to the standard of looking at things beyond the filters that, that, that we are motivated by, whether it's in our jobs or in our technical professions or whatever else. And so 
that's a very simple framework and that needs to get more and more robust over time. Um, and I'm sure that both Wally and Ed have other frameworks or, or just even examples of, of how we can continue to get better, but it's not gonna come up whole. Like we're not gonna just have an answer, right? It is it's absolutely iterative. And we need to apply that that sort of framework to things that have already been done as well to re-examine, you know, to look at look at stuff from the past that's still prevalent and just see if it fits. And I would throw ethical in there as well, you know, as another E. But yeah. I think that's totally fair. I mean, to build off each of your points, I agree with you, but I'd, I'd add two additional things. One, um, it, we you have to hold yourself to Karen's earlier point about being honest about limitations from the beginning. It's sort of like designing or coding. If you don't set a standard till you're done, then you always look at it and go, oh yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Okay, good, we're done. Um, be honest about what you're trying to achieve at the beginning before you embark and then hold yourself to that. You know, do we look ourselves in the eye and say, you know, did Natick, was Natick more sustainable as a data center? Uh, did we help the Snow Leopard Trusts help endangered animals? Did the uh, Xbox controller make Xbox more accessible to motoskeletal challenges? Um, hold yourself accountable. The other piece of it is share it out. We publish a lot of guidelines on accessibility, on inclusiveness, uh, and then the community will help you either apply those lessons or they'll hold you accountable too. They'll say, this is great, but you can continue to grow. You can do these things that you're not yet doing. So I think having that honesty about what good looks like and then having that humility about Hey, we'll share this with the community and find out if we got there. Is are the mechanisms that helps us grow? There's two things in that that I really love. One, that sense of humility as the beginning point of this approach, and also something that I've been thinking about. And I'm going to offer this to all of you as well to talk about the question that is on your mind, the burning question that keeps you up at night, the thing that you're thinking about as it relates to responsible innovation in the future. The thing that is on my mind lately, thinking about inclusion and design and the intersection of responsibility is something that Stacey Abrams said in a quote a couple of months back. And she mentioned this concept of learning in public. And I'm really asking myself what that question is. We work at companies, we're public facing, we're under some scrutiny in terms of the actions we take and the ones that we don't. And so I'm thinking about what does it look like for for us to learn in public as we move towards a different future. And so I'm very curious from your perspectives, what are what's the question that's animating you right now as it relates to responsible innovation? Yeah, I mean, I, I said it before and I'll say it again, which is like, how do we get it wrong the right way without it being fatalistic, right? Um, and not just fatalistic to an organization, but also like, wider teams and, and this is like we know as humans we always go too far and that's not a cop-out like we just we categorically do and so how do we bring ourselves back and that's it, it's something that does keep me up at night but on the positive side what keeps what keeps me up at night is you know what does a world look like where we unlock the full human potential of like very soon nine billion humans like what is that what velocity of change the true impact that we could have, because right now it's not 9 billion people, it's not 6 billion people that we're looking at, it's a smaller subset. And so like the, the positive side of this is, is like, what is the full potential of actual radical inclusion um, in this space? And it doesn't keep me up in a negative way, it keeps me up in a really excited way. Um, and, and how do we do that? Mm -hmm. Wally, what do you think? Yeah, I really just want to pick up on Karen saying it keeps her up in an excited way because I I, I I would agree. I think the the rate of change and the opportunity and what we're gonna see within, you know, my my kid's lifetime. And you know, I, I raised money as a question before. I think the whole value system has the opportunity to change. And I think that's going to have impact across everything. And I think it's going to make it possible for us to really be inclusive to really have voices and people at the table that we never had before and don't have now um because we don't we haven't really you to use your term we haven't been humble enough 
to actually invite them in. And that's what we're doing now. We're starting to say, we don't know the answers. We need people to tell us the answers. And so we need to ask them. And that's, you know, that's really it for me. Yeah, I, I think I think I think that's similar to what keeps me up, which is we need people at the table and we've we each live at the unique intersection of our lives. And I think that the, the richer the experience of the people who are making the choices, uh, the fewer blind spots we're going to have, the fewer uh, unseen biases that we carry, or at least we'll be able to identify them and hopefully mitigate them or address them. Um, and we've got to make that real, though. It's it's not enough to say um, we want people at the table. It's how do you get them at the table? And I know all the companies represented on this call are like us. You know, we do student dissertation grants and student internships for underrepresented groups. We do grants for nonprofits. Uh, we do partnerships and publish guidelines. We all do. We even uh, we founded the partnership on on AI with Google and Amazon and others. So we're all represented there. I think that reestablishment of community in its broadest sense is the way that we have a much more holistic view and we can ask bigger questions and we can come up with more inventive solutions. Yeah. Um, that emphasis on community is what I think what's going to be key going forward. I don't think we're there yet, but I think all of us in all of our, all the ways that each of our companies are doing are getting us closer to that. Uh, Chiomo, what do you think? I agree. I think that, um, when it comes to communities and thinking about who actual communities are and actually the context in which they sit and expanding the aperture not to just the people who we're focused on but that wider world i think it's a step that we're all trying to make i think that it involves all of us to think about collaborating with each other in really different ways and advocating for things that we're not used to advocating for at the tables that we sit at and so mm -hmm. I think that's the great promise, you know, both for all of us sitting here, but also for all of the people who are watching this conversation, that this is a journey that we're all on and it's gonna take everybody. And it's gonna take stepping out of a space of comfort and moving <laughs> into a space of unknown and ambiguity. But it is, as you know, Karen said out at the very beginning, the promise is high and the stakes are high. And so, yeah. This has been a really wonderful conversation, and I want to thank you all for that. I'm going to be thinking about durable value and how to create it for a long time after this, and really appreciate you taking the time to share your thoughts today. Thank you to everyone. <laughs>